Hey guys, I'm so glad you are joining us for such a pivotal episode on making sure that you are healthy together. Today, we're talking about vital questions that you need for a sex checkup in your marriage. I am so glad you came for this episode. I'll tell you why. Yes, I know Michael Scott jokes are going to be flourishing once again this year, just like last summer in terms of that's what she said, but we can handle this, right? We can laugh together. We can make sure that we have the very best of hopefully intimacy for you and your partner together in marriage, and also the very best questions for you to walk away from this episode with. And this is just a mini episode, so thank you for hanging out just for a few minutes in your day because I know it's going to be worth it. And I'm so excited to walk through these 10 questions with you. As you know, not only have I been doing this work for 20 years now with couples, which is pretty fun and cool and and all of the above because I'm so grateful that people will talk to me about issues of depths. And even this week, people are like, huh, like, I know you don't want to hear this. I'm like, yes, I actually do. I actually signed up for this with all these years of schooling and I am right here for it all with you and just want to make this a safe place for you to have total, uh, you know, availability to unleash what's actually happening in your lives and in your marriages so that you can get healthier and happier together. So that's what the basis for these 10 questions are. But as I start there, I want to say to you, make sure you get in touch with a good counselor or coach. If you really need that one-to-one space and we also make it safe in our collective, we will be opening it up again in August for those who just want a safe, small group to talk in and more of an email relationship with us as well, because we always invite our collective to ask us questions, to talk very closely with us and to come to our meetings. But you might be like, I don't want to talk in a group about my sex life. So that's okay too. If that's you, make sure if you guys are really struggling that A, you pay attention to today, that might be just the momentum and liftoff you need, or that you get involved. Hopefully it's an and, and with a counselor or coach, because I'm telling you, it feels so freeing to be able to do good work. And I have a lot of people I've trained as Enneagram and Marriage Certified Coaches, and we definitely walk them through sex techniques for their clients so that they are well-trained. I would never want anyone who is carrying that e certification badge not having the tools. And if they don't know something, because we're always learning, right, then we always refer to specialists. So make sure that you are doing your work with due diligence to find not just any helper off of that betterhealth.com or uh, psychology today. Those are awesome sources, betterhelp.com and psych today. But to be honest, um, somebody really who cares and shares your values and uh, really is invested in allowing you to feel safe enough to talk about this topic. So now that we've gotten that out of the way briefly, make sure you head to Enneagram Marriage if you need the referral to one of our, uh, our people. So that said, the first question out of the 10 I want to ask you is that really important space slash question of, are we having sex to reduce stress or are we afraid to have sex because we're stressed? And to be honest, uh, in the past, it was thought that if you're stressed, you can't have sex. And I think that that's an important piece to discuss and to discover together. Cause I actually think that is true for some of you couples out there that you won't be as available for sex because you won't have that parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest space for enjoying yourselves together. If you're not relaxed, But I also want to tell you that there is no should here because some couples and partners within a couple might be one is this way and the other is that way will actually feel like sex is makeup sex and we're stressed. And so it's okay to go ahead and enjoy this, even though we're stressed because this is going to be our de-stressor. And sometimes when I work with couples, there's a lot of unhealthy shoulds around sex in this kind of a way where it's like, no, that's just a personal preference. So bring that question in together to ask each other, are we avoiding sex because we're stressed? And if we are, what can we do about that? Or are we both feeling like the other one doesn't want sex, but we actually both know "Hmm, we are stressed. We want to go have sex and that will help us to be less stressed. So that's a really good question is what are your expectations around your stress together? And so it's also okay though, if your spouse differs. So I want you to decrease the shoulds, but I also want you to be comfortable if your spouse says, you know, actually, I'm so glad you asked because when I'm stressed, I'm not comfortable having a sexual relationship with you in that moment. Um, 
So be open to whatever they say here and also be open to sharing your truest desires and needs in this particular area of stress. Because guess what? Your next question within that realm can be, uh, what could we do to decrease our stress together? So it doesn't mean just because you're stressed, oh no, now we can't ever have sex. It just means, well, now we need to make sure we talk about that. Um, this is similar to question two, which is, and feel free to be writing these down into your phone, guys. So first question is the stress question. Like, how do we feel about having sex around stress? What can decrease our stress is within that bullet point. And then the next question is just, how can we, uh, you know, really process whether we're wanting to have sexual intimacy to bring us closer or uh, because we feel close. And you might find that there's also a disparity here between different Enneagram types and personalities where one of you says, oh my gosh, like, I just love to have sex because it makes us feel so close. And the other person's like, I don't want to until I feel close. And a great answer to that could be that you have a date night because Wes and I have something of this nature where I'm just like, I need to feel close to you first before we're going to engage. And he's more like, oh, this makes me feel so close to you. So I think that that's, and I'm not saying it doesn't change through the month or through the years or seasons. I'm sure it does for all of us, right? But I think it's important that you ask that question of each other. How are we enjoying sex in that way? Does it bring us closer or do we need to do something else to bring us closer? And for some of us, foreplay begins the moment we stop having sex and we are now like, okay, now I hope you'll do acts of service for me. Or I hope that you have a lighter pep in your step. Or I hope that this makes you want to have a date night. Whereas the other person would say, no, I like foreplay. That's like, I'm talking 15 minutes before before uh, we actually have an orgasm. So it's also okay to very much have some disparity around what that foreplay is as you ask these questions about sex bringing you closer and what it means to draw closer to one another. The most important thing for you, I think, through all these questions is that you know that your marriage and your narrative together is very unique. And that's the most beautiful part about your marriage. Nobody shares your exact story. So your answers are not gonna be the same as mine or the person to the right or the left. So don't worry about that. Just really nuance for you guys on this stress and how you like to engage sexually around your stress and also around your closeness and whether you like to have sex to draw closer or in order to feel close. Now, the next question I have for you is whether you're doing your love maps and your John Gottman work just in general to draw closer to one another as far as stories around your life, your day-to-day -day interactions. Because honestly, if you don't have a connection point every day to dissect, to discuss, to really walk through what each of your days is like, well, we know that most couples as they enter marriage and get close and past that honeymoon period, they don't have that wonderful conversation rolling naturally. In fact, marriage statistics show that people are less and less satisfied with their marriages across the years. So it's important that you do the opposite. We don't want to be normal or average here. We want to be better than normal or average. We want you guys to be leaning in with love maps questions. So I am putting in the show notes for you some love maps question with a new freebie for you so that you can truly enjoy. And we do freebies like this all the time inside of our collective and our coaches training. If you ever want to become part of those, uh, as I I said, that's opening up again in August, but coaches training is all year long. If you ever want to become a coach, I give you so many worksheets. So this one for all of you though is free and it's in the show notes so that you could just ask these love maps questions to say like, oh, like, you know, what's your favorite food lately? And you know, what's happening at work lately? What are some of your goals? And you'd be surprised how these things change and how it truly affects your intimacy together, like into me see versus just uh, sex. So you now are becoming partners and not just partners, not just coworkers, but lovers so that you are not on that parent partner level, but digging deeper for the true stories of what it's, you know, like for you on the day-to-day -day level. Now, the next question goes a bit with this, and this is the question you should be asking yourself, and this is a good shit of, are we trying to make sex fun or intimate? And it doesn't mean it couldn't be both, but I think that there's a lot of emphasis in the 50 shades of gray culture to make ourselves just, you know, I hate this word titillated. Um, I'm going to say it. Okay. <laughs> I hate that word. I get really, you guys know who listen to the show. Like I get very OCD about certain words, but it works. So we really want you to work past just a, a response for desire, but to be able to say like, maybe this will make me feel uh, aroused in the moment, better word, uh, but I am going to make sure that I carry forward with what will be a long-term satisfaction in the relationship. Because too often I see marriage books saying like, do things that you wouldn't want somebody to do to you, harm each other, and then expect to be intimate and satisfied afterwards. And it's like, maybe have 
some fun and dirty times then. And then afterwards you're sad and you're like, I'm so distant. So try not to make it about fun as much in that way. Make it more about intimacy and safety and good things together so that you guys are actually enjoying one another long-term. And so you don't have to feel like, ooh, we're bad, dirty, wrong, or just even they don't like me because I asked them to harm me or they did harm me without me asking. And I know that that's something that people are really enjoying in culture a lot, but I'm just asking you to dig deeper and say like, I am worth not just a five minute fun, but I am worth loving. I am worth getting to know and being more vulnerable. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, now, the next question that I want you to be asking yourselves is number five, are we focusing in on pleasure or orgasm? Because I think that with men after 30 struggling more and more with testosterone, uh, with women all the time uh, in various seasons of the month and of life, sometimes we're overly focusing in on orgasm and instead of connection and truly really loving each other right where we're at. And that's important. I've talked about it many times on the show that uh, it's important. And I've learned so much from the beginning of marriage to now to be able to just accept whatever is and to be able to, uh, you know, love Wes no matter what. And I think that's really key. And I think that that's something that a lot of young couples are thinking has to look this one way. But I've worked with so many couples where, uh, you know, 10 to 20% of women have never orgasmed and that's not what it's about. Or, you know, many men don't have the arousal that, you know, allows them to lead to orgasm. And, and sometimes they finish in a different way or sometimes they don't finish at all. And that's okay because your story is unique and you need to take some deep breaths so that any kind of uh, rude words that are about to fall out of your mouth are taken by a calmer, kinder, gentler, more loving response together so that you guys can be, yes, authentic because you're calming your nervous system down, allowing yourself to feel love and adoration versus just this panic sense of we should be doing this. I need arousal that leads to orgasm or else. And so instead, remember the power of your narrative of we're growing closer. Our love is beautiful. Whatever the outcome of this sexual interaction, I'm so grateful. So it's more about pleasure than orgasm. And I think that's a great goal for for women in general too, just because women don't have as many orgasm experiences as men. Although I do want you in this whole 10 question series today to really be hopefully also exploring one another so that you can approach orgasm uh, at times as well. So I think that the number six question can help with this. And that is, are we making time to connect with our parasympathetic nervous system? And that just means, are we taking time to rest and digest? Or are we hopping from screen to screen to screen and expecting that that's going to lead to intimacy? Now, I'm going to just put my cards on the table to say, I think we're all guilty of that. I know that sometimes even better is if we can do that for ourselves. So that's why I'm putting my cards on the table. Sometimes I need to set that book down and to be ready for that. Now, I also want to say getting yourself to the bedroom is a great step, though. Because sometimes we don't even do that. And so it's a great step to be able to say, let's try to connect. Even if we sleep in different spaces or we have different times where we go to bed, let's have a little time. And it can be, you know, some couples want to have sex nightly. Some couples want to have sex once a year. I mean, it's different for every couple. Most are about once a week. But your story is unique. Don't worry about that as much as compromising that number uh, because of course, spouses differ. And so you want to come to the middle as much as possible with that number. And then you want to be able to be as available as possible for those times so that your parasympathetic nervous system is ready for a sexual experience. Uh, and in that way, we're coming back to that earlier question about stress. Like, can I have a sexual experience that's positive when I'm not as stressed? Of course, it's going to be more inviting then because uh, you can't even, if you're so much in your fight and flight nervous system response of the sympathetic nervous system, you're not even going to be in a space of connecting at all. You're literally running. And so you want to be able to say, this is what makes me feel rested and relaxed. It might be a bath. It might be a cup of coffee decaf uh, or tea. It might be that book. And then you close the book and then you connect and you look in each other's eyes. Um, and I'm just going to add here that something that can be really important is to kiss, to hug, to hold hands. These all release oxytocin. So those might be even parts of it too, where you say like, let's just enjoy uh, reading aloud together or having a time of prayer together or connecting on a heart to heart level and looking in each other's eyes. That's always a good space to be able to start calming and slowing and right there doing that work with you. Now, another piece that I did say I was coming back to is this ninth question, and that is vulnerabilities. Are we comfortable in voicing our true needs, wants, vulnerabilities, insecurities? This is where the rubber meets the road, my friends. This is where it really counts for you to be able to say to your spouse, 
okay, here's how I'm feeling. I have done my work. I have maybe listened to the last episode and, you know, have better sexual self-esteem, but here's where I'm still struggling. You know, could you encourage me in this area or uh, could we avoid this area? Could we turn the lights out today because I'm struggling in this way and you don't need to make it a 15 minute drawn out conversation, but just being honest and vulnerable about who you are is inviting for a spouse who is safe. Now, if the spouse is in a, a mode of, uh, you know, victor and hero versus villain or, you know, better spouse and worse spouse, they're going to be tit for tat. They're going to be like, oh, what are you bringing to the table? I'm bringing so much more. I'm so bummed that you're not bringing something as good or you're not as confident. But truly loving spouses will say, and I hope you'll increasingly become this way. We all have some journeys to do here, but to be able to say, oh, yeah, thank you for being so real with me. I love that uh, God gave me you so that I can comfort you in this area so that I can remind you how lovely you are or uh, how strong you are. Whatever the adjectives that really uh, arouse you will be just beautiful here. So make sure you're inserting those. Make sure you are shoring one another up with accolades of love and figuring out together honorably and, uh, you know, really allowing one another to see this is a word I like. This is a word I don't like. Um, you've probably heard me say before, I don't like the words making love. And it's not that it bothers me if somebody says that on my show, it's just not my word. So I've actually asked people like, uh, you know, when we were doing the get, <laughs> getting your marriage challenge on, I was like, can I not say that? Like, I'll be part of this challenge if I don't have to use that word love making, because it was a word my parents used all the time. And I was like, oh, like that just brings up images of my parents that I don't want. So find your word words and your keywords that you want to avoid, as well as the ones that truly allow you to play. And you know me, I'm a words person. So, hey, you might not even care about words. Okay. Now, last, um, are we turning towards one another through the day? Are we providing that affection all through the day? Not just in that moment, but are we basically building that foreplay up throughout our day so that each and every single opportunity that we're hoping for sexual experience doesn't fall on deaf ears because our spouse is like, okay, where did you come from out of left field? I had no idea you were interested and you weren't turning towards me when I was talking to you. You were just on your cell phone or your computer or you were uh, jogging or who knows what it is, but there's something you're doing instead or work and they're trying to get your attention. So remember that, that when we make a bid for attention, we really want to respond about 90% of the time to our spouse. And that's important. And that's, you know, sometimes I've been even doing marriage work, literally researching, and then I'm like, stop researching marriage work and actually do your own marriage. And uh, Wes can attest to that, but it's really important that we all do that increasingly so that we can be uh, the best supports and knowing that we're better together helps all of this journey too, to believe truly with me. And I do believe this, that when we are attuning to our family members, they are stronger, they are healthier, and we are all as a community lifted up when we empower others. And we have a lot of statistics that help us to know that self-care is great. You know, I'm an advocate for that, but to be able to love somebody else is actually better research-wise too. So make sure you're loving your, your partner, yourself. Make sure you're really leaning into what they're trying to say to you and with affection and get that oxytocin going. And these are the 10 questions I want for you. So the calls to action I have for you are are take the questions that you either just listened to or possibly journaled out today with me and bring at least one of them to your spouse. And also, if you need those love maps, so grab them out of the show notes as well. Now, if you've got those deeper issues, make sure that you are checking in with us about our collective as well as about uh, a coaching or counseling relationship if you need just somebody to hear your unique story and to help validate where you're at, to help you walk through uh, the journey of how to really be honest about this. This is something I deal with constantly. And later today, I'm going to be jumping into these conversations as well. I already know um, that I'm going to be confronting somebody in a gentle, loving way about how they can have um, more intimacy for their spouse who isn't as interested. So this is really an important conversation sometimes on that one-to-one -one level, but sometimes, uh, you know, just hearing an episode like this might give you that courage you need. So thank you so much for being brave to tune in today, to doing your work, to growing more intimate and safe and closer together. I love these Wednesday minis because we really get to uh, just take some tips tangibly and move forward with ever our personality type. So doing this work right here with you, whether you're watching on YouTube with the crazy purple lights behind me that my husband put in my office, I'm not sure why, but a client really liked them last night, or whether you are uh, enjoying the, uh, you know, just the audio version, I'm here right with you doing the work. Thank you so much. Make sure to leave us a review on uh, Apple because it helps so much for others to be able to find this. And I am so grateful that so many of you have found it, that we are all here together. Thank you. You guys take care. Bye-bye.